Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to our Vaginal Health webinar. Uh, my name is Becky Burbage. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of SPA, and I'm here with Karen O'Sullivan, our clinical consultant, uh, and we run the SexWise programme, which is a nationally funded programme by Public Health England, uh, uh, which is bringing you this webinar as part of our programme of resources to support professionals. Um, so today we're going to run for about 30 minutes and there should be time to ask some questions at the end. Um, we'll be covering the following topics, which I won't run through um, in detail, but you can just see there on the screen. Um, so just an overview of vaginal health and then we'll be talking uh, in a little bit more detail about kind of what's normal and some symptoms and other things that you should consider when women present uh, in clinical surgery. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the webinar is part of our SexWise program. Uh, SexWise is a new national resource giving honest advice about contraception, pregnancy, STIs, and pleasure. Um, it's aimed at the public, and we're very keen for you to signpost the public um, to it as a source of information and advice on all those topics. Uh, but we are also very much um, hoping to support professionals through the program as well. Uh, so with things like this webinar and with resources on the website. Um, and just to flag up that uh, I mentioned SexWise is part of FPA, and FPA's information leaflets and other resources can be downloaded from the resources section of SexWise and also linked to at the bottom of relevant pages. Uh, but to sort of get into the webinar a bit more, why are we talking about vaginal and vulval health? Um, the reason is that we found over the years that lots of women attend clinic with concerns over discharge. Um, FPA doesn't run clinics ourselves, just to be clear, but the, the people that we work with and Karen, who will be talking to you shortly, is an experienced sexual health nurse. Um, so we know that it's something that women worry about. They have concerns about whether uh, the secretions or discharge is normal. They worry about kind of the amount, the color, what the right smell should be. Um, and it's something that's not necessarily taught at school. Um, it might be sort of touched on when they talk about starting periods and menstrual cycle, but it's often not really covered other than a brief mention. So people kind of leave school not necessarily knowing what normal is, um, what they should be worried about, what they shouldn't be worried about. Um, and we've also seen, um, certainly over the last couple of years, but I think for longer than that really, the marketing of unnecessary products which really fuel women's worries and we get quite cross about that. We've been contacted about a lot of things over the last few years, um, including vaginal deodorants, um, so-called herbal detoxes, detox pearls that you're supposed to put in your vagina to name just a, um, a few of those. Um, and they create a lot of worry and they also perpetuate the myth that actually uh, the vagina and vulval area need a lot of care and might need a lot of washing and they fuel into this kind of fear that um, women don't smell right or that vaginas shouldn't smell or should smell of something kind of um, pretty and feminine rather than just a, a normal vaginal smell. Um, and so we've just sort of touched on what's, what's normal um, in a moment and then we're also going to just look at what some causes are of unusual or abnormal vaginal discharge, including vaginal infections, including STIs. Um, what we're not going to touch on is kind of other causes of, of unusual discharge, such as skin conditions, allergies, polyps. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a few other causes, but we're really very much focused on kind of um, uh, vaginal infections in this webinar. So I'm going to hand you over to Karen now, um, who's just going to talk a bit more to you uh, about uh, what is normal. Hi. So I think one of the questions that I'm often asked, women will come in and say, I've got, I've got discharge. Uh, and I spend quite a lot of time talking about um, what is normal. Um, vaginas are supposed to be wet um, and they're supposed to smell. Otherwise, we wouldn't uh, be able to walk down the road or um, have sex or, or, or be comfortable moving at all. So vaginal secretions are normal. Uh, the vagina is designed to naturally produce um, secretions uh, and lubrication. Um, particularly as part of the sexual response cycle. So vaginal increase, secretions will um, increase when sexually aroused. 
Um, and the sexual response cycle is something that I sometimes will draw for uh, patients so that they can see um, the types of things that, that happen um, during sexual arousal. And it's normal to, to, to get more lubricated or more wet. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the things that really struck me about this was um, when I was uh, learning about uh, fertility awareness a number of years ago, and I had some pictures, um, uh, French um, instructions written underneath them, and I asked somebody to translate it. And one of the friends that translated this for me, uh, the literal translation was that with secretions, the woman feels well oiled as she walks down the road. <laughs> which I thought was a really lovely description, actually. So some people might not, but, but I thought it was a very good uh, description. Um, so as we age, uh, vaginal secretions can reduce. And we will be talking a little bit more about um, um, that a little bit later. Uh, but it's important to, 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 to look at, at the issues for um, older women as well. OK. so. Secondly, so we've got vaginal secretions, and then we've got cervical secretions. And these are also normal. Um, so secretions produced by the cervix and controlled by hormones. And therefore, the amount um, and texture varies through the menstrual cycle. Um, so cervical secretions are part of a normal, healthy vagina. Um, and if those secretions change, and if the, the um, there is an unusual discharge or a change from normal, um, that might be that something is, is out of balance um, or there's a, a problem. But I think I spend a lot of my time talking to women about what is normal. So there are two types of normal cervical secretions. Um, and as I've said, these are due to hormonal changes um, through the menstrual cycle. Uh, so we have the thick, sticky, creamy secretions. These block sperm from, from getting through. Um, and uh, when I first, again, was, was looking at fertility awareness, um, this was a revelation to me um, that this is how all the progesterone methods of contraception work. Um, and I got really quite excited about you know, actually understanding that uh, the thick, sticky, creamy secretions um, trap the um, sperm, the ejaculate, in the acidic vagina. And that's where. Um, the sperm will die within about um, six hours um, uh, because of the acidic vagina. And that also suddenly made sense as to why we would leave the diaphragm uh, or cap in position for six hours after sex, because, again, you know, the sperm will be um, uh, not effective after that time. Um, and then if we look at different parts of the menstrual cycle, uh, and cause clear, wet, stretchy secretions. Um, so these can look like raw egg white. That's a good way of describing them to women. Um, and these are produced before ovulation. And these actually um, assist the sperm in swimming through. So they provide lovely, clear swimming lanes so that swim, sperm can swim through, have races with each other, um, <coughs> and uh, hang around in the crypts in the cervix, um, have a rest, you know, get their deck chairs out, a bit of sun tanning. <laughs> Um, so the estrogen secretions cause nice sperm-friendly secretions. And women will sometimes say, um, you know, they, they cope fine with the thick, sticky secretions, and then suddenly they say, well, I don't, I don't like the fact that, you know, my knickers get wet. Um, so it's about looking at the menstrual cycle and looking at um, the effects of the hormones and how secretions can change um, at different times of the month. Um, and I do go through that with women and actually draw pictures and get out our lovely Body Works leaflet to go through um, and explain where the um, different secretions um, come from and, and, and why they're there. So um, I've stated this a bit, a little bit about looking at uh, fertility awareness methods. Um, cervical secretions are one of the ways of monitoring fertile and non-fertile times of the cycle. And this is to help um, plan or prevent pregnancies. So certainly if somebody is wanting to uh, achieve a pregnancy, um, it's really useful to look at whenever there's any secretions there at all, that's a good time to um, have sexual intercourse. Um, and as I've said, the estrogen secretions, those lovely, clear, wet, stretchy secretions, assist sperm in, in managing to, to swim up um, 
through the canal. I also think that monitoring your cervical secretions or having a, a look and being aware during the months is really interesting on a personal level. Um, and again, talking to women about what is normal um, and what is healthy. And then if you can notice the differences between the two types of secretions um, on an ongoing basis, I think it removes a lot of the concerns or worries um, that women have. But again, on our um, SexWise website, we've got uh, uh, information about fertility awareness methods um, if people wanted to look at that in more detail. So to recap, um, vaginal health secretions, they vary through the cycle and through the life course. So the amount of secretions does vary with age um, and can be affected by hormonal factors. So um, secretions will change during pregnancy, during the use of hormonal contraception, um, when you're taking HRT. Um, and it's really just to, to, to reassure women Secretions are a normal part of a healthy vagina. Um, and learning what's normal for you so that you can notice any change from that normal um, and, and come and ask for uh, more information or help at that point. But it's really about learning what's normal for you. It's also normal for vaginas to have a smell. Um, they shouldn't be odorless. Um, and I also spend some time talking to women about why vaginas have a smell. So um, vaginas produce pheromones. This is our natural sexual attractant for a mate. Um, so vaginas are supposed to smell like vaginas <laughs> and not deodorants or rain or flower or petal. Um, the other products that, that change the smell of vaginas um, are unnecessary. If an unusual smell becomes, if the, the usual smell of vaginas becomes stronger or unpleasant, then it may mean that there is something wrong. So that would be a time to, to again, um, go for uh, help or to, to talk about that. Um, but it's about knowing again what's normal for you um, and looking at do you need help if things change. So what can upset vaginas? <laughs> Um, vaginas are self-cleansing, so they look after themselves um, if we leave them alone. They have healthy bacteria called lactobacilli, um, and these can help keep um, unhealthy bacteria um, in check. Um, so there's a balancing act that goes on there. And vaginas do have the natural ability to keep themselves healthy if we let them do their thing and stop interfering with them. So one of the main causes of upsetting this natural healthy balance is too much washing or using unnecessary products, which we've talked about um, already. So the main advice is to wash the whole area with water only. No washing inside the vagina. Vaginas don't need to, to um, be scrubbed. They don't need fingers poking around inside to, to um, wash them out with soaps or anything. No other products are needed. And I also talk to women um, about trying to avoid putting products in the bath as well. So try not to wash your hair in the bath. As much as people like it, don't put bubble bath in the bath. Um, and some women um, use things, products like Dettol in the bath. And that's a, a big no-no because, or bleach or TCP. Um, again, it's not needed. It's not. It's not required. Um, we have. Um, we don't have problems with uh, unclean water um, in this country. And some people will use that as a, a, a sort of warm childhood remembrance of. You know, grandma used to put a little bit of Dettol in the bath um, when they were children. If that is um, something that is comforting, then put the Dettol in a separate bowl on a, on a radiator in the bathroom so you get the smell but not in the bath. Um, vaginas definitely do not need Dettol or bleach or TCP. Um, sometimes something like an emollient uh, substitute can be used um, uh, if the vulval area is very dry. That's more to do with age or if people have skin problems, for example, eczema, then that can be useful. But main advice is to stick to water only and vaginas and vulval areas don't need anything else. So what can cause unusual discharge? We've talked about um, what normal is, and then if there's any change from normal, that's when you might need to, to seek um, help or advice. 
So things that can cause unusual discharge, vaginal infections, um, such as bacterial vaginosis or thrush. And these are common causes um, of unusual discharge, particularly BV, bacterial vaginosis. Um, obviously, sexually transmitted infections, um, such as chlamydia, trichomonas vaginalis, and gonorrhea, can cause symptoms um, of discharge. However, um, it's really important to be aware that uh, people do not necessarily get symptoms of sexually transmitted infections. So that's really, and we're going to talk a bit about it um, later, but it's really about taking a good sexual history. So if somebody comes in to see, see you at a, a, a clinic with a concern, um, sexual history is really important to, so that we can rule out um, uh, other problems. And other causes not covered in this webinar, um, such as things like foreign bodies. Some people will sometimes have retained tampons or um, retained condoms. Um, I've had people come in to me before and say, we used a condom, but, but now we can't find it. Um, you know, it's not on the floor, it's not in the, uh, on the bed. <laughs> we don't know where it is, so um, it's been left inside. Um, and then need to talk to patients about the need for emergency contraception, um, sexually transmitted infection screening, and retrieve the um, foreign body as well. Um, okay, so we're also not talking about uh, polyps, allergies, fistula, but again, when we attend with unusual discharge, it's really useful to, to take a good history so that you can rule those things out. So have a look at some of the common causes of discharge. Um, BV, bacterial vaginosis, very common cause of, of discharge. It's not a sexually transmitted infection, but can develop after sex um, and is often more common in women that have um, frequent sex. And this is because um, vaginas are acidic in nature and ejaculate uh, is alkaline in nature. So that's going to upset the um, normal acidic balance of the vagina um, if there's um, frequent ejaculation because that's going to upset the um, normal acidic um, pH of the vagina. Um, and BV is one of the most common causes of vaginal discharge. One in three people with a vagina will have BV at some time. So it's something that, that most women will have at some point during their, um, their lifetime. Other common causes, um, so BV causes not fully understood, but in people with BV, there's less of the healthy lactobacilli, um, so the good bacteria. There's an overgrowth of other types of bacteria, um, and as I've discussed already, the pH of the vagina um, is, is more alkaline. Let's move on to thrush. Again, it's not an STI, but it can develop after sex. Um, commonly caused by a yeast fungus, uh, most commonly candida albicans. And again, three out of four people with a vagina will get this at some point um, in their uh, lifetime. So it's very common, um, but thrush is sometimes diagnosed when a discharge is caused by something else. So women will often come in, people will often come in and say, um, I think I've got thrush again. Um, and while we should believe what people say, I think it's really worth talking in more detail about, um, you know, is it the same as before? Is it different from before? How does it vary from your, from your normal? And to do a sexual history to look at... Um, are there any risks that, that the discharge might not be thrush, but might be something else? Um, so the chances of thrush um, can increase in pregnancy, and this is due to uh, hormonal changes, much more common in pregnancy. It's common if people have taken antibiotics. Um, antibiotics work systemically, um, so they will kill off all the bad bugs that they are used to treat, but they'll also kill off the good bugs, which are lovely lactobacilli in the vagina. Um, and once good bugs have, have, have died um, to the antibiotics, it's very easy for that balance um, to be upset. Um, chances of thrush increase with chemotherapy or other illnesses. Sometimes we need to talk to women about um, uh, wearing tight or synthetic clothing. 
So um, vaginas um, kind of need to breathe as well. <laughs> I think we're talking about, uh, I sometimes talk about types of knickers that women are wearing, so the underwear, um, and looking at things like um, G-strings, um, uh, and the fact that uh, thrush is an organism that lives quite happily in our digestive tracts. That's when it gets from uh, the anus into the vagina, which can be quite close together, um, uh, then that can cause more problems. So some of the advice would be about um, wiping from front to back when you go to the toilet um, so that you can reduce the things uh, that, that might cause thrush to, to be coming into the vagina. Also, stop using products that irritate the vagina because, again, both thrush and BV um, can take over. So we're really back to vaginas looking after themselves unless we interfere with them, so we need to leave them alone. <laughs> Other causes of unusual discharge, we've always got to think about doing a sexual history um, to rule out sexually transmitted infections. So chlamydia is a common cause, um, but really think about more than two in three women won't have obvious symptoms. Gonorrhea can cause a discharge. Trichomonas vaginalis um, can also cause symptoms similar to thrush and BV. Um, so here we've got a slide looking at uh, comparing um, some of the symptoms of thrush, BV, uh, and TV. Um, but it's really important to um, say that uh, a lot of people won't have signs and symptoms. And sometimes it can be difficult to say. So, so descriptions of discharge can be subjective. So when you're talking about what's it like, is it difficult to tell the difference between thin, watery, and white, um, thick and lumpy? Um, so sometimes there will be a smell, sometimes there won't. But the important thing to think about this um, is that people could have more than one infection. So you might have BV and thrush, or thrush and TV. Um, so we've got a very good uh, slide from the um, uh, Royal College of General Practitioners, STIs in primary care. Um, it's a really good um, resource, uh, for particularly for primary care, um, which is available on the uh, internet. We've got the link later. Um, but it's really good to be able to look at that table to um, to, to think about um, the distinguishing d between them, but don't assume that it's one or the other, um, uh, and don't rule out the fact that you could have more than one infection. So it's back to taking really comprehensive sexual history so that you're not missing out um, on, on, on uh, any STIs. So for up-to-date guidance um, on diagnosis and treatment regimes, um, we have got details of both the BASH guidance and the RCGP guidance. Um, and if you are concerned about either recurrent symptoms, so people that, that will have recurrent infections that don't seem to go away, or sexually transmitted infections, um, then signpost to, to GUM or take the test swabs to, to rule that out. Um, and don't forget that it's possible to have more than one cause of, of unusual discharge. Don't forget older people. <laughs> uh, vaginal and vulval health is relevant throughout the life course. <clears throat> and menopause can affect natural vaginal and cervical secretions. Um, and again, we've talked about the hormonal influence um, uh, to, to vaginal secretions. So due to the decrease in hormones that, that happen in the perimenopause and in the menopausal time, vulval area and the vagina can become dry. Um, and this leads them to be prone to tearing and fissures, um, uh, more thrush, discomfort, um, and sexually transmitted infections, um, although low in uh, older people, um, statistically they're still uh, there, still on the rise. So you really need to be looking at sexual history, um, new relationships, um, all those sorts of taking a good sexual history to rule. So these changes in uh, lack of secretions can cause discomfort with sex. Um, and people will assume that this is a natural part of aging um, and not ask for help, but ask them. Um, I started asking, um, you know, is sex comfortable and okay for you um, when I was talking about smears or taking smear tests? And it's amazing the number of people, if you ask the question, 
the number of people that, that will actually say, no, it's not okay, and um, you know, what can we do about it? So vaginal estrogen treatment can be used. Um, it's very low dose, and it can be used for as long as is needed. Um, and uh, prescriptions, my, my prescriptions for vaginal estrogen treatment um, went up quite dramatically when I started asking the question. There's also a variety of vaginal moisturizers, um, which is also uh, an option. Um, so again, some good evidence out there that vaginal moisturizers um, and vaginal estrogen cream uh, can be really helpful. Oh, thank you, Karen. Uh, so you're back to Becky now. Um, that's the end of the uh, presentation, so it's over to you now for any questions. Um, if you just bear with us a moment, you should see um, a little box pop up on your screen now, um, and you should be able to um, type in any questions there for us if you've got any. Um, just while you, we'll give you a moment to have a think about that and to um, see if there's anything that anybody wants to ask. And in the meantime, we'll just pop up the slide. So we're just signposting to some further sources of information there um, uh, that we've mentioned uh, throughout the webinar. So the, the guide to STIs in primary care, uh, the guidance, uh, BASH's guidance on STIs, which as we mentioned is a good source of kind of up-to-date um, uh, treatment. Um, uh, linking back to our Sex Wise for Professionals page um, and also our, our People Over 50 booklet, which you might find um, it's, it's less, the People Over 50 booklet is less for professionals, but it's um, a really nice booklet to, to give out to, um, to older patients and clients and just kind of run through some basic changes that can be expected. Uh, and we are also just flagging up FPA's training as well. Um, back to the questions. We have had um, a question come through now, um, which I'm just going to hand over to Karen to answer. <clears throat> okay, so we've had a question about which vaginal moisturizers um, do I recommend. Um, I'm very hesitant about recommending anything particular because uh, everybody's different. Um, but there's some good um, moisturizers that it's worth. So if I'm talking to women, I will usually write down um, all three um, and suggest that they try them for themselves. So there's a, a couple that I would usually talk about. Um, yes, Replens, and Silk, S-L-Y-K. Um, so those are three um, that are marketed uh, as vaginal moisturizers, um, particularly useful uh, in the menopause. So again, it's, it's, it's about trying out those. Um, I think vaginal estrogen is probably a better bet um, on prescription, um, but certainly I would usually uh, refer women to things like the British Menopause Society um, uh, to look at the, uh, or Menopause Matters, um, to look at uh, some of the evidence base around those and some of the advice. Um, I'll just hand back to Becky for a sec. Oh, thanks. So we're getting a few questions coming in now. Just to flag up, we're just coming up to time um, now. We've got we um, we're running for 30 minutes, and we're just on about 29. So I think we're going to have time for one more question, um, which I will get Karen to pick out of the ones that are coming through. But uh, what we'll do is the questions that we don't have time to answer, uh, we will take those away and. Um, We'll do written answers, which we'll send around with the recording of the webinar um, and certificates later on. So we, we will do answers. Don't worry that you won't get the answer. Um, but I think we're only going to have time to, to just answer one more now. So just back to Karen for that. Um, yeah, I reiterate what Becky said. There's some good questions coming up. Um, there's a question about since antibiotics harm the good bacteria, do you recommend trying pH balancing products um, before turning to antibiotics for BV? Um, and the person um, that said that says that they find them very effective. Yes, again, I, I talk about pH balancing products, but um, they are expensive. Um, so I would usually talk to women about just wait and see if it goes away by itself. 
because if you stop the, the, the washing um, and stop upsetting the, the natural balance of the, of the vagina, it will sort itself out if we, if we let it. Um, so again, I'll take it on a personal level. I'll talk to women about you know how how distressing they find the symptoms, and sometimes women will say, well, "Look, I really want the antibiotics because I don't like the smell." And then we can talk about, well, you might get a thrush then afterwards. And sometimes it's about working with the woman to say, well, we'll treat you now this time, but try the other things um, in between. Um, and yes, again, the pH balancing products are something that you can try, but, but as I've said, they are quite expensive on an ongoing basis. So there's some really good questions there, but we have run out of time. So I'm going to pass back to Becky to just finish off, and we will send out the answers, the questions and the answers to you later. Thank you. Oh, hi. Thanks, everyone. And sorry, we um, didn't have time to get through more questions. Um, so I just really wanted to say thank you for giving up part of your Thursday evening to join us. Uh, we really appreciate it and we hope you found it useful. So say, if you didn't catch it all or um, you sent in a question, then things will be coming round. Uh, just to very quickly flag up our um, webinar on STIs on the 29th of March. If you haven't signed up for that one already, please do. And we've still got one more day um, to order sex wise resource packs, um, which are have posters, stickers, and other things, and they're available to order through the SexWise for Professionals page of the SexWise website. Uh, and you can also register um, to get our information updates by email uh, if you would like to do that. Um, so thank you very much. I think I'm going to close the webinar in a moment. You should get something that pops up and asks you to give feedback. Uh, so please do give feedback if you can. Uh, we'd really appreciate it, and um, it will help us improve in the future. Uh, so thank you very, very much once again for attending, and uh, hope to um, see you at the next webinar. Thank you.